Bible that you have with you. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew on to the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I'll know that you'll save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, and a bowl full of water came out of it. You may be seated. Over the month of March, I'm going to be preaching a series entitled Miracles Still Happen, dealing with the signs of wonders and miracles of God. How many of you still believe in miracles? Gideon said to God, if you save Israel by my hand, as you promised, I need you to give me a sign. I will put wool fleece on the threshing floor. There's dew on the fleece and all the ground is dry. Then I'll take that as my sign that Israel is going to be saved. And the next morning, what Gideon asked for came to pass. I want to preach for a little while today uh, using as a subject, it's Pisces season. It's, uh, for the old saints, throw me out. Give me a few minutes, please. It's, uh, it's Pisces season. Would you look at the person beside you and tell them that's what it is? Look them in the eye, tell them it's Pisces season. In the history of traffic court, it's interesting to note that stop signs have just been around since 1915. The first one popped up in Motown, Detroit, Michigan, on the cusp of the car craze. Because Detroit was busting at the seams, serving as the headquarters of Ford Motor Company. Interestingly enough, initially stop signs were yellow in order to maximize both night and day visibility. It wasn't until 1954 that sign makers were able to cultivate the technology for durable, fade-resistant red coatings so that the signs would be in uniform with traffic lights. Because the traffic lights signify and indicate stop, then the sign should be synonymous. For one moment of your life, have you not found it curious that all over the world you can find stop signs but nowhere can you find a go sign. First Samuel 30, David and his men have just returned back to the camp only to discover that the enemy has come in and destroyed the cities and stolen their wives. In verse number eight, David prayed unto the Lord, shall I go after, hear his voice, shall I go after what has been taken from me? And the Lord responded, go after it, because if you go after it, you shall get everything back. I'm mindful I'm not preaching to everybody who's in the room, everybody who's viewing, but there's a small remnant who need to know the only reason why you are in church this morning is because God knew you needed a sign. Today, God says, I'm giving you the sign in blaring neon lights that this is the month you are to go for it. Everything that you've been hesitant and ambivalent about after today, God said, take the foot off the brake. 
you have got to go after everything that I have put in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, and in your dreams. I need you as loud as you can. Would you just declare this month, I'm going to go for it. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 11, Isaiah 7, verse number 11, uh, the prophet says, you can ask for yourself for a sign from the Lord your God. You've given scriptural permission. Ask for yourself for the Lord to give you a sign. Those of you who are needing of a sign from God, that's what I want your prayer to be even in this hour. Would you throw your head back and just cry out to the Lord, Lord, show me a sign. The greatest sea merchant, missionary, by the name of Noah, was in the biggest storm in the history of the earth because it just kept raining and it wouldn't stop. It kept raining until he lost everything. When the entire earth was subdued and entrenched in precipitation and water, the flooding, was overwhelming. At the end of those 40 days, the Lord sent two signs. And the two signs that he sent Noah, I bear witness that he's serving to you today. The first sign that he gave Noah after that tumultuous storm, he sent a dove with an olive branch in its mouth. And the dove with the olive branch in his mouth was to alert Noah, hear this, that the rain has dried up and it is now clear for you to rebuild. Some of you don't need that word, others of you need it more desperately. In other words, he was saying to the person who's sitting two rows over from you, the storm you are in is officially over. And everything that is necessary for you to rebuild your life is now available. Some of you have been through any storm, so you don't understand it. I want to make that announcement again for 500 of you. The storm in your life is over. And you have now been cleared to rebuild every area of your life that you have lost in the flood. That was the first sign. Second sign is uh, Noah opens up the hatch, looks out the window, and when he looks out the window, he sees a rainbow. And God says, I'm giving you a rainbow as a sign. And the sign here, there's 300 of y'all. I don't know how you're going to be able to contain yourself. Here's what the Lord says to Noah, and as a consequence, what he's saying to you, the storm you just came out of, if you were not covered by me, it would have killed you. But you will never go through a storm that bad again in your life. I'm not telling you what to do, but don't wait till the battle is over. Shout right now like you have survived the worst storm. Since you have survived that storm. You survived it. You survived it. It was rough. It was hard. It was difficult. It was touch and go. Things got tight, but you survived it. Folk gave up on you. They walked away from you. They counted you out, but you survived it. You went through a season of depression and rejection and isolation, but you survived it. There were days you didn't want to get out of the bed and nights where you couldn't sleep, but you survived it. Every once in a while, every once in a while, when you aren't hearing from God, when you go through seasons where God isn't talking, you just need God to show you a sign. A sign of affirmation that I'm not crazy. I need you to give me a sign that you're still with me. 
I need a sign that the promise is still good. I need a sign that my family was wrong. I need a sign that my haters are gonna regret what they did to me. And in the book of Judges we find, in the book of Judges we find an otherwise unremarkable young man by the name of Gideon, who has been accosted by an angel who announced, you are anointed to free your people. The, the anointing is not on your life just for you, but you are anointed to set other people free. And Gideon is feeling insecure about his ability, and he feels that he is absent of qualifications, so he begins to barter with the Lord. And in Judges chapter 6, he says to the Lord, I'm going to put a wool blanket right here in the middle of a plot of grass. I'm going to bed. If you are with me, Lord, let the blanket be wet, but let the grass be dry. He woke up the next morning, new birth, and you're not going to believe it. When he woke up the next morning, the blanket is so wet that when he wrings out the blanket, it can fill an entire bowl. In other words, I need you to hear this, God's sign to Gideon is that the fleece was not like what was around him. All right, I've lost you. Sometimes the evidence that God is with you is that you don't match your environment. And folk don't understand who it is that you are because they want you to be as miserable as they are but they don't understand what God has on me is not like the stuff that's around. The sign you are going to be victorious is that you are different from everything connected to you. And you keep frustrating yourself trying to assimilate with that in which God has separated you from. You don't understand why many of your friendships are not genuine or deep. You don't understand why you got nothing in common with family members. You don't understand why you keep putting yourself out there to people and they reject you and misunderstand you. God said you are in the world, but you are not of the world. There's something different about your life. So much, so much of the contemporary church is liberal in its lifestyle, but conservative in its thought process. And I give it to you again. So, so much of the contemporary church is liberal in its lifestyle, but conservative in its thought process. We have confused tradition with being Christian. had a meeting yesterday with the millennials of our church and I said to them, we're sitting on 200 and almost 50 acres of land. 250 acres of land. In the next 30 days, the Georgia legislative session is going to vote on whether they're going to make cannabis legal in the state of Georgia. Said to the millennials, how many of our black men are swollen up in a prison pipeline for nonviolent offenses? I asked the millennials, we got 250 acres and most of our young black men who are in jail are in jail for either possession or intent to distribute. I want to know why we wouldn't, I asked them rhetorically, what would happen if the church had a cannabis farm? Now, if it's legal, if it's legal, that's what I asked the millennials. I asked the millennials that rhetorically. By eight o'clock last night, some of the old saints started getting on the phone. Y'all heard what this new young preacher trying to do? He's selling drugs at the church. 
We got to call somebody. This don't match up with the apostolic vision of what we supposed to represent. How are we going to sell drugs at the church? Because we have confused that which is traditional with that which is spiritual. I'm trying to wrestle through a full seminary education, a third generation preacher, trying to figure out how we live in an age where if you go on Facebook and look at people's profile, that you'll have people in the same profile use hashtag Team Jesus, and right next to that, hashtag Team Capricorn. It's a new age, it's a new season. It's, it's nonsensical how theologically we claim to look to the hills from whence cometh our help, but then we look into the stars in order to get direction. You know how many saints who are in church right now who never read the book of Hebrews but read their horoscope every day? It then got real quiet right through here. And I was of that same mind frame, that same passive aggressive theological resistance until I read a book. I read a book called The Witness of the Stars. The Witness of the Stars written by theologian B.W. Bullwinker. And theologian B.W. Bullwinker in his book, The Witness of the Stars, uh, says that biblically we have edited out for our own convenience what scripture states. All of us who are in the room, at some point or another, if you were raised in the church, you were a part of the Christmas play. You ain't have no lines, you was a shepherd in a bathroom, <laughs> in the fellowship hall, <laughs> with an empty box that used to have your mother's shoes in it, saying it's a gift for Jesus. And they asked the wise men, how did you know where Jesus was? And the wise man, you did, you said in that Christmas play, we followed the star. That the wise men were not philosophers, the wise men were astrologers. They were studying the stars to get some sign or understanding of who God is. You can jump over Genesis chapter one. Go to Genesis chapter one, because I look at you, I feel a, a tomato thorn spirit coming at me right now. Look at Genesis chapter 1, and in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 14, Genesis 1, verse number 14, look at what it says. It's the first book of the Bible. It's the first chapter in the first book of the Bible. Genesis 1, verse number 14, God says, let there be lights in the expanse of the seasons of heaven to separate the day from the night, and watch this, the stars will be signs for the season. Man, 50 church people just got mad. I'm right here in the Bible. So secularists in search of compatibility have often asked upon meeting somebody new, what's your sign? Ask them all, oh, no, you, you're a Libra, I can't date a Libra. <laughs> I don't know nothing about your story, nothing about your testimony, nothing about your income, nothing about your habits, nothing about how far back you are in child support, but because you're a Libra, Can't date you. And that's because the Bible is clear that many of our people die from a lack of knowledge. What we don't know, and because in fact we have been ill-equipped and unproperly taught, is that we don't even understand that the signs usually, historically, were theological indicators that give a reflection of the life of Christ. It is not until the Greeks invaded up the Jerusalem temple and stole our books that they bastardized the concept and made it an expression of an ode to fake gods. For example, Virgo. I ain't never seen y'all this uncomfortable. You muttering under your bed, is this right? 
Example, Virgo is a, a derivative of the Latin word virgin. It's a woman, watch this, with a branch in her hand and an ear of corn in her other hand. So she has a harvest even though she's a virgin. Y'all not gonna like it. Jesus was born of a virgin. You do understand that historically and theologically Jesus was not born in December, but historically he was born in April. Y'all are getting ready to get lost, you're gonna be firecracker hot. So now, if Jesus was born in April, then Mary had to be conceived the end of August. All right. Um, so Virgo or virgin season is August 23rd through September 22nd. Y'all stay with me. That, that, that's the season where a miracle can happen without human assistance. So even though Jesus was born in April, stay with me, he was conceived in August. The latter part of August or at the middle part of September. I don't know how many of you all can handle it, but I'm believing by faith that God is going to produce for some of you a miracle, watch this, without people assisting. You, 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 you've been waiting for other people to do it. But God said when you get this next blessing, you will be untouched by other people. And folk not going to understand how you got it. Here's your shout. How you got it without sleeping with nobody. That they, they, they not going to understand how it was able to happen for you without you compromising your integrity, your virtue, your moral, or your conviction. Yeah, th 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 this is a season where, where you're going to get blessed without help. Th th did you hear what I just said? I need you to elbow your neighbor tell them this is your season where you gonna be blessed without getting any help. Thank God for the folk that watched you struggle. Because if they watch you struggle, they gonna have to watch you skyrocket. That this is the day where you gonna be able to say, can nobody do me like you? You're going to get it done with no assistance. You're going to get the job without a letter of recommendation. You're going to get the house with jacked up credit. You're going to get the interview with no background experience. You just got to tell yourself, if God be for me, who in the world? Be seated, please. Look at the person beside you. Tell them this season, you're going to get it with no help. Hallelujah. There were some people that watched you struggle, and they knew what you needed, but they still wouldn't do nothing to help you. God said, because when this happens, all the glory belongs to me. That God stood up. Snap your fingers, do your dance. You gonna do it all by yourself. God, I can't hear nobody in here. Look, look at the person beside you and tell them you gonna do it all by yourself. I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get you, thank you. Huh. Hallelujah. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. I feel God in here. You look crazy waiting to get married before you buy a house. Go buy your house now. Let God so bless you that whoever comes to you gotta have something to offer. You gotta be able to do it by yourself. Neither, neither my sister Neither my sister or my mother 
ascribe to science, neither one of them. But if they did, because they were both born between October 23rd and November 22nd, they will both be considered Scorpios. Scorpio is the figure of a huge scorpion with his tail lifted up in anger. In Hebrew, it's translated to mean wounding or conflicting. Satan is the scorpion who stung us through the temptation of the forbidden fruit. It is the sign of struggle. The evidence that you are anointed and destined is that you come with struggle. That great abolitionist Frederick Douglass said that without a struggle, there can be no progress. If you're struggling through something, it means you get ready to walk into something. God, 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 God never releases anything without a struggle attached to it. I'm talking to 50 of you who are going through the greatest conflict of your life and you don't even understand where it came from or why it is attached to you. You get angry because you hear folk complaining about small petty stuff and they got no idea you got the weight of the world on your shoulder trying to keep everything together. You ain't got time for petty people because you're trying to keep yourself. Dealing with conflict. So you've adjusted to conflict your whole life. Always having to def defend yourself. Having to explain yourself. Having to be misunderstood. You know what conflict is. You try to be nice to nasty people. You know what conflict is. You're always trying to take the high road when Negroes drag you down. You know what conflict is. They don't like you, so they try to kill your idea. You know what conflict is. They don't understand your favor, so they make up lies about you. You know what conflict is. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. The serpent's head will be crushed by the seed of the woman. In case you don't know, we are the seed. And it is the intention of God for us to single-handedly crush the head of oppression, racism, and classism. Look at the person beside you, tell them that's why your life has been a conflict. Because the enemy is afraid that you will realize what you were born to do. The enemy is having a nervous breakdown because he hopes you don't get the epiphany that you are not regular, average, or run-of-the-mill. But God is going to use you to break every generational curse. I don't know how you able to sit there and contain yourself knowing that Satan is about to be defeated. Oh, hallelujah. We, we like victory, but we hate warfare. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. I said we like victory, but we hate warfare. Some of the conflict that you are in is because of your grandparents didn't destroy the serpent. In the history of milita military science, America can never claim victory over the war in Vietnam. Why? Because they never declared war. And I came to tell somebody today that you came to kill whatever serpent runs in your family. Hallelujah. Then I'm tired of seeing my family dealing with the same stuff year after year after year. But God said today, crush his head. Take the hair off of the serpent. Be seated. Be seated. This is my last time asking you to do that. After this, I'm no longer responsible. Hallelujah. You, you're supposed to cut off the head of whatever serpent has been in your house. Hallelujah. It, it, it ain't gonna live another day. I sucked it up in January. I didn't say nothing in February, but I ain't playing with it in March. I'm cutting the head off. 
there is not going to be disrespect in my house there's not going to be dishonor in my house I'm cutting the head off hallelujah long before we had these mega churches like new birth hallelujah our grandmothers was in little wooden churches Y'all ain't saying nothing to me that, that had a sign in the front on how many people showed up for Sunday school. How, how much was paid in class dues. Y'all don't remember that. Hallelujah. And there was your grandmother who never had stilettos. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Never had a Chanel bag. But she would come down the center aisle and say, Satan, we going to tear your kingdom down. And I need somebody in new birth today. Will you just cut off the hair of the star here? Huh. Hallelujah. Huh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. According to the calendar, watch this. According to the calendar from February 20th to March 20th is, um, is Pisces season. February 20th, March 20th. I, I know you don't believe in all that. It's all right. Um, stay with me. Uh, you, you use it as a metaphor, as a parable, symbolism, whatever it is that makes you comfortable. Uh, February 20th to March 20th is, um, is Pisces season. Uh, Pisces, watch this, is a constellation representing two fish. Uh, two fish that are tied by their tails. One fish is headed to the north and the other one is parallel to the sun. Jesus told us to be fishers of men. Oh, Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. He says, I, I am getting ready to pull people out of the abyss of sin and bring them into the kingdom of salvation. This, this, this is getting ready to be fishing season. That folk that swore they would never step foot in church again. Folk that said they would never be a part of ministry are getting ready to come back to God. Folk that left for new science, religion, for meditation and Islam are getting ready to come back to Christ. I'm talking about your son. That's a five percent of your daughter. That's a Buddhist. Your husband. That's an atheist. God said in the next 30 days, I'm bringing them back to me. It's fishing season. Oh. Hallelujah. Jesus is the fisher of men. And because he's the fisher of men, I think you forgot how that one of the most profound and pronounced miracles that Jesus ever curated was two fish and five loaves of bread. Hallelujah, in case you forgot, it was 5,000 people in the park that day. And the disciples ran to Jesus and said, send them away. But Jesus said, no, I'm not going to send them away. What do you have? I don't know whether I told you, but it's Pisces season. And all they had was two fish. The sign of Pisces, y'all ain't liking this, is two fish. He said, watch this, if you give it to me, hallelujah, I'm going to bless it. Mm. But after I bless it, here it is, I'm going to break it. And after I break it, I'm going to give it away. I came to tell somebody, you know you're anointed. It's after you got blessed, you went broke. But God said, notice I blessed you before I broke you. So that when you got broke, you wouldn't lose your mind. There's some folk that are looking at you and they think you got everything together, but they got no idea. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning understanding that if I be lifted up, I'll draw. says all I had was two fish five loaves of bread and with two fish sign of Pisces two fish with two fish watch this I was able to feed five thousand 
I'm going to say this to you because it's Pisces season. This is a season where God works with two fish. Up until March the 20th. Everybody's not going to get it. Those of you who have uh, the elasticity of thinking to be able to embrace it, can I give it to you? Between now and March 20th, no resources will run out. God, I can't hear nobody. Every time you got to put money out, it's going to come right back in. Every, every time you pay a bill, God is going to restore it. God is getting ready. This is a season where, watch this, resources are stretched. But here's the greatest shout of the day is this is the season that every need is met. Hallelujah. If you don't need nothing, don't say nothing. But if your testimony is, I had some good days and I had some bad days, but when I think things over, my good days, they outweigh my bad day. Y'all, let's get out of here. Would you grab somebody by the hand and pull their hand and say this season, everything is going to stretch. Your money is going to stretch. Your paycheck is going to stretch. Your joy is going to stretch. Your peace is going to stretch. Your anointing is going to stretch. Your ideas are going to stretch. Your business is going to stretch. If you believe it, you ought to shout right now your praise. Stretch. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I said pull on that neighbor. Stretch. It's not going to run out. Stretch. You going to pay every bill. Stretch. You better find somebody. Would you just pull that neighbor? Stretch! Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thy hand from me, whither shall I go? He's going to stretch your resources. He's going to stretch your finances. You ain't going to have to ask nobody for nothing. He will supply all of your needs. Yeah. I'm going to do this quickly if I can. I ask God to show signs, wonders, miracles. Us in this room. Those of you at this altar, I want you to take two steps back from me, please. If you're at this altar, I want you to take two steps back from me, please. How many of you ever been in a place where you just needed God to show you a sign? She's not on. But he's with you. I want to pray an emergency intervention prayer this morning for those of you who are facing eviction this week. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are, but God dropped you in my spirit. And I need God to do something for you. You're supposed to be evicted between now and next Sunday. I need you to meet me at this altar, please. This ain't the time for you to be shy. This ain't the time. Don't worry about these people looking at you. I need you to get to this altar.
Because you standing out there don't mean that you're any better than them. Come on, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I'm, I'm sick of saints that are saved and stuck up. You got to remember, God had to stretch some stuff for me. I don't know where it is that you are no more. What it is that you're going through, you got a notice on your door. I don't know whether it's pink or yellow, I need you to come. You're supposed to go to court. Scared they're going to set your stuff outside. You've been trying to figure out which friend to call to see if you sleep on their couch till you figure it out. Having anxiety because you don't want to have to separate from your children. I need you to meet me at this altar, please. I, I, I came to tear Satan's kingdom down. If you don't believe that God is able, you ain't got to say nothing, but I, I, just, I just need to hear the sound of anybody that ever ran short. Anybody? I want those of you who are in the sanctuary, wherever it is that you are, would you just stretch your right hand of faith towards them? Hallelujah. Thank you. I want you to open up your mouth and just begin to pray on their behalf that God would do something for them. Hallelujah. Thank you. Ma'am, ma'am, when are you supposed to be in there? Thank you. When are you supposed to be in there? Huh? It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. Are the five things the president recited to Fox News as an example of his mental acuity. But in actuality, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment is meant to detect signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. In error, he wanted to use science to best Joe Biden when he has ignored science to administer what is best for the nation. After all, science at its lowest common denominator just builds and organizes knowledge from tested and proven explanations. Even when it's been proven that COVID has not been humanly engineered, in press conferences from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, it is still referred to as the disease from China. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Organization devolves that they were admonished not even to use the word COVID in any official documents. Even with the president's son, school being closed for this entire academic year for in-person education because of contamination risk, Secretary DeVos is still championing for public schools to be open. In spite of the warnings by Dr. Fauci and the administration, the president, none of his staff, was wearing masks up until two weeks ago when Secret Service and administration became infected. To not acknowledge the facts 
is akin to spitting in somebody's face and trying to convince them that it's raining. The global consulting firm McKinsey and Company released a report entitled The Future of Work in Black America and it spells out gloom for our community. Automation and robotics will disproportionately impact the employment of the unskilled amongst us, leaving in its wake 132,000 jobs at stake from those who are untrained. If we don't begin actively, aggressively, and vigorously recruiting our children to become engineers, biologists, and computer scientists the same way we do for athletics. There'll be an entire generation that will be sidelined from the game of life. Our children are gonna have to be pushed towards STEM or forever be left out on a limb only being reserved for menial entrance level occupations. I've got to confess to you that part of the handicap emanates from the church who has narrowly presumed that science is antithetical to scripture. Nowhere in Bible study or even in seminary did anyone ever proffer thermodynamics as an extension of God. Thermodynamics, which is the arm of physical science that deals with energy. For instance, since you're already in Genesis, go back to chapter 2, verse number 1. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 1, here's what it says. The heavens and the earth, here it is, were finished. The Hebrew word used here is the last definite tense of the word finished. Look at it again. The heavens and the earth were finished. That word meaning finished indicates here it is that the action is completed in the past and it will never again occur. Genesis 2 and 1 says it was finished. Therefore, the creation was finished once and for all. Can you imagine, friends, that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he was quoting Genesis 2. It is finished. The first law of thermodynamics states that there is neither matter or energy that can be created or destroyed. Saying all energy that exists already exists all matter that is in the universe is already in the universe. There is nothing else being created. It is finished. I want you to understand that whatever it is that the enemy thought he was going to do to you, it's already finished because no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. It is finished means nothing is left undone. He that began a great work in you, I'm telling you, is already finished. He knew you while you were in your mother's womb. It was already finished then. Before there was the foundations of the earth, it was already finished. The book of Genesis, if you do a, a etymological exposition, you'll understand that Genesis derives from the word gene. Genes, you know, as a heredity of unity, of that of your DNA or molecular structure that dictates who you are, what you are supposed to look like, and your outcome. Genes or Genesis is the beginning or it is the DNA of the Bible. That everything that happens from Exodus to Revelations comes out of the genes of the first 50 chapters. And if you go to the book of James, you'll find in chapter 8 that the earth, here it is, has been submerged under a flood. The wickedness of the people has become so unnerving for God 
that he presses control, alt, delete, wipes the whole screen afresh and anew and wants to start over. And watch what God does. He unleashes a rainbow. He unleashes a rainbow after the storm. And I need you to understand that the rainbow appearing, hear this, is not a miracle. The miracle, hear me, is that we don't understand science. Is that off after all of that condensation, after the cumulus clouds have been gathering for 150 days, light begins to peer through the water. The droplets become consumed with the heat. And when it is that the light then per penetrates and permeates the water and comes through on the other side, rainbows begin to glisten. And this is basic science operating on the principle of thermodynamics. And we find it already in Genesis chapter 8. And in Genesis chapter 8, the Lord then says to Noah, after unleashing the rainbow, he says to Noah and the entire family, come out. Here it is, because you've been stuck in quarantine. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it because Noah and his family have been in quarantine for 150 days. Today, as you watch me, you don't even understand that we have been under the shroud of COVID-19 for 163 days. On the 150th day, he says to them, come out of what you've been living in. And what I appreciate is he's not just talking to Noah, he's talking to his entire family. I prophetically declare and decree to every person, here it is, that has your genes, that has your background, that has your molecular structure, that has your blood type, that has your last name, that as God said to Noah's family, I now say to your family, you're coming out of this. And you're coming out of it and you're not going to look like what you've been in. Because on the other side of COVID, you're going to be stronger. You're going to be better. And I've got a brand new world for you to begin to occupy. When Noah comes out of the ark, I want you to see what happens. He's not looking for a cigarette to calm his nerves. He's not running to the mall trying to buy something. It's not making reservations at his fam favorite restaurant. When Noah comes out of the ark, something amazing happens is that he builds an altar. And when he builds an altar, please don't miss this, he then gives God an offering. I know I took the long way to get here. But he makes an offering unto God as soon as he comes out and God is walking by. And when he's walking by, he then sees the sacrifice that has been made. Sees the sacrifice that's been made and the Lord stops right there and says, Noah, I see your offering. I see your sacrifice. I see what you did right there. I see what you just put on the altar. And this is what I'm going to do, says the Lord. I am now lifting the curse lifting the curse that nobody else is going to ever suffer like this. Nobody else is ever going to have to endure this level of hardship this length of time. And all my years of coming in church when I heard about curses being broken, it was strapped to all night prayer. It was connected to vials of olive oil. It was connected to the working at the altar. I had no idea that an offering can break the curse. When Noah gave that offering, immediately the curse off of he, his family, and generations yet unborn would never have to endure that level of God's wrath. Maybe some of us are still under a curse because we haven't made a sacrifice. Because we've not given an offering. We've not extended a tribute. What generational curse do you need to break off of your family? 
I don't know whether it is the generational curse of hypertension, the generational curse of uh, divorces, domestic violence, of incest, of criminal activity, of time in jail. What generational curse needs to be broken? I declare and decree not another person in your family is going to find themselves combating with cancer. Not another member of your family is going to die prematurely from heart attack and strokes. Not another member of your family is going to find themselves always contaminated with low self-esteem. God says, based off of your offering, I am going to lift the curse off of your family. I don't know how it is you ain't sowing right now, how you're not giving right now, how it is that you're not making your sacrifice right now. I need you to know it, it, is, not, um, it is not rocket science. As long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time. There's going to be harvest. In other words, if you want to harvest, where is your seed? You already have in your closet. You didn't throw away winter coats during the summer. Why? Because you know winter is coming back around. Amazingly, you got in your basement right now Christmas lights. Why? Because you believe with every ounce of confidence that as sure as it's August, you're going to live to see December. Why is it that you believe in seasons in the natural, but you don't believe in seasons in the supernatural? I don't know how you feel about it, but I need a harvest to hit my life. I need a harvest to hit my family. I need a harvest to be able to be reaped by my children. And I feel God tapping me on my shoulder. Saying, Jamal, you don't have to go to MIT to figure this out. All you need to understand is that Genesis has given you the blueprint that if you sow your seed, a harvest is getting ready to be connected to it. I want to know how desperately do you want your harvest to come? For the last 18, 19 weeks, we've been uh, feeding um, some 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 people uh, with, uh, with groceries. And uh, initially, we were doing it with Publix, with World Vision. Uh, we were doing it, here it is, with Emory University. About six weeks ago, something crazy happened that I, I couldn't believe. Rural black farmers started getting up early on Thursday mornings, piling up their truck, driving a new birth. They said, Pastor, we need you to help us because we got a harvest, but we got nowhere to put it. The restaurants are closed. People are not going out to eat like they used to. The demand is lower. Here's what the farmers said to New Birth. We got to get rid of the harvest because it's too much. That's what I'm praying is getting ready to happen for you in this season. That God so overwhelmed you that you start looking for people to bless. Start looking for people to sow into, to give into, to say, I got so much, God. Show me where I can be a blessing. I want God to so enrich your harvest that you're too embarrassed to testify because your testimony will sound like bragging. I need your harvest to be of such that somebody's standing in front of you in the grocery store that you'll just tap them and say, I got this. I want God to so bless that even while you are an empty nester that you're going to be able to fiscally finance another student to get through school who otherwise would not have an opportunity. I need you to have that kind of harvest. The Bible says that the fishermen were fishing and the fish just started pouring in that their nets began to break and they had to bring in other smaller ships and said, let us pour into you. And I believe that by God's grace, that you are not getting ready to have a breakdown, you're getting ready to have a breakthrough. Because everything you thought you can hold is about to overwhelm you. 
I want blessings. I never know you've never heard it on this wise. I want blessings. I hope you'll shout about it in your living room. I want you to have blessings that are unmanageable that I can't even keep up with it. I, I want you to be living in such a grace that they got to remind you, why didn't you cash that check yet? I want you to be in a place where you're finding receipts of stuff that is owed to you. I need the harvest to come back, but it ain't rocket science. It's contingent on your seed. And here's the part that I love that I got up this morning to share with you on this day. According to uh, Genesis chapter 8, um, verse 22, it won't cease. That's the only thing you need for the rest of the day. I want you to type, type that right on the screen. It will not cease. Let me give it to you in an in a easier translation. It won't stop. It, 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 it won't stop. Have you ever heard the expression, here it is, residual blessings? That you're getting blessings coming to you in two to three different ways that you never anticipated or expected. It won't stop. I came to have church this morning in the Trap Museum. Many of you are looking at us with a wayward eye. Why are you coming to a Trap Museum? that glorified a subculture of drugs in a community that is dearth of economic development. Because I wanted another generation to understand that in order for you to thrive, in order for you to move, in order for you to make an impact, no corner is necessary. <laughs> Nothing illegal is on the table. I want to have the kind of blessings that only drug dealers and athletes talk about. I want the kind of blessings where I can go buy my mama a house. I want the kind of blessings where my cousins know if they in a jam, I'm who you call. I want the kind of blessings that people marvel at the glory of God that circumnavigates around my life and they want to know what is the secret? People who are jealous of you, people who are hating on you, people who don't understand, the favor that's on your life, tell them it ain't rocket science. It's seed time and harvest. As long as I am sowing, I'm gonna be reaping. I wanted to pray with you today that your harvest will come because here's what I discovered. You never plant and reap in the same season. But I want you to be able to reap in this season for the seeds that you've sown in the previous season. Those of you who are in need of a harvest, I need you to lift up that hand. Why, Pastor? Because I'm believing by the grace of God, this is the last time you're empty-handed. That stuff is gonna start moving in your direction that you can't explain, that you can't defend, that you can't make sense out of. I'm praying that a harvest will come that will confound people who believe they are wise, that will unnerve people who thought they were smarter than you. I'm believing that God has given me to give you the chart of the course of how not to survive the rest of this year, but how to thrive the rest of this year. How much you lift up that hand, please? Let me pray for you in this moment, in this hour. Jehovah Jireh, I come to you this Sunday morning asking that you will honor our coupon. We've clipped it out of Genesis chapter 8. And we came to redeem it, God, because this has been a hard, a harrowing, and a daunting summer. Waiting for PPE, waiting on, un on unemployment, waiting on support. God, we came to redeem it. We come with a lifted hand and no weight on our hearts because we trust that you're going to honor your word. I pray, dear Lord, that just as the summer is getting ready to shift into fall, change the season of my life. Change the season of my existence. Change the season for the entirety of my family. 
and I need you to do it. My faith is built of such that God, you can do it before Labor Day comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it amazing that all of our years, all of us can recite the narrative of Noah? Didn't it rain, children? It rained all night long. All of us know about the animals coming out two by two. All of us know how it is that the people in the town laughed at them. But somehow or another, they hopscotched over this part. That when he came out, it was Noah's offering. It was his sacrifice that made God stand still. I'm telling you that when you make this monumental move, a lot of people are not going to talk about it. People are not going to affirm you. They're not going to be praised or lauded. But God is getting ready to break curses off of your family. I want you right below me. There are several different ways by which you can give your sacrifice. But the sacrifice has got to be of such that it gets God's attention. When I come to you next, I'm going to be in Hebrews where it is that we talk about the sacrifice of praise. And all of our lives, we've been told that the sacrifice of praise have been dancing and clapping and waving your hand. But the sacrifice of praise is your offering. So what it is that you give. I want you to give right now, the first level of which ought to be your tithing. It's getting you in practice for where we're going to be on uh, September 13th. But I want you to get that seed in your possession. Grab your phone. I need you to please electronically to do it through uh, GiveLify, through push pay, text to give. Even if you're going to mail it in, even if you're dropping it off at the church, I want you to do it. Your seed is going to save somebody from the trap. Your seed is going to get somebody off the streets. Your seed is going to redirect somebody's life to get on the path called straight. I want you to do it. God loves a cheerful giver. I want you to understand it ain't rocket science for you to get saved. It is not rocket science. All you got to do is confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. And from that, you can be saved. You done tried everything else. It's time for you to try Jesus. Would you do me a favor, please? I want you to surrender your life, your will, your destiny, your path. I want you to surrender it over to our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our prayer counselors are standing by. You see the prompts right below me. Ask that you would utilize them. Immediately, somebody will get in touch with you. But I want you to be a part of our family. More than that, I want you to be a part of what Dr. King called the beloved community. I want you to make sure that your name is in the book of life. It can all happen today. And the good news is you ain't got to run around the church because we ain't in church. Your eyes ain't got to roll to the back of your head. You ain't got to foam out of your mouth. All you got to realize is I am jacked up without God. I'm tore up from the floor up, but when I give it over to him, it ain't rocket science. Just like there's winter after summer, just like there's heat and there's cold, just like there's seed time and there's harvest, there's also grace and mercy, and it's available to you. I'm appreciative for you. Do me a favor, please. I've got some things that we want to share with you. Do not turn off or turn away, but I want you to stand by. What happens next may be what you need 